Indeed. So it's 11 o'clock now, so I'm going to make a start because I'm a stickler for time. Um, so I'm just going to run you back to the first slide. So yes, good morning, everybody. So my name is Simon Corby. I'm director at the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. Welcome to our Innovation Solicitor. So it's now Innovation Pitch Series. Um, so this is how the program is going to work. Got five minutes from me, five minutes from my uh, colleague, uh, Catherine, who's going to talk to you about our Reducing Plastics in Construction group. Uh, and then we're going to have a, a, about eight minutes from our three uh, judges. Sorry, I just uh, sped past. So we've got Carl Taylor, from, uh, who's director at Accord Housing, and Carol Costello, practice leader at Cullinan Studio, and Jess Hivrufnak from, uh, uh, she's a sustainable development advisor at Reba. So they're going to share their expertise. They're all members of our Reducing Plastics in Construction group. And then at 11.40, uh, we've got 10 minutes with each of our three pictures. So we've got a two minute video that we're going to share with you. And then we've got eight minutes questioning. So four of those minutes is from our judges and four from our audience. So um, if you can ask a question in the Q&A, then we'll ask you to um, put your camera on and ask that in person. And then we'll be voting and making a decision as to who goes through to the grand final. So here are the instructions. So it's uh, put your questions in the Q&A, upvote if you like the question. Uh, as I say, we'll ask you to uh, unmute and uh, ask your question. If you've got any technical problems, just pop them in the chat and we'll endeavour to sort you out. So just a reminder, uh, ASBP, we're a, a not-for-profit mission-led membership organisation. So we're an unusual organisation. We're not a trade association. We're mission-led, and this is our mission. So it's healthy, low-carbon built environment. And so, so we ask our members to sign up to that mission and to help us in that mission. So uh, that's how we work. And um, so we do lots of events. We've got weekly events at the moment. Um, we've got a couple of research projects on the go. We're looking at product standards all the time. And we aim to inform policy. And these are our sort of strands of work, if you like, health and well-being through to social value with everything in between. So our membership, uh, we've got over 70 members from, from the business and from the industry and academic members. And so membership is growing in these difficult times, which is very good. So our uh, innovation pitch series is aimed at innovators and startups. We've had two events already. Um, so EHAB uh, won the first one uh, in June on insulation. And, uh, and then our next one was on packaging, uh, which was great. And today's event is focusing on flooring, paints and finishes and how we can try and get away from plastic based products there. Because if you look all around you, you are surrounded by plastic based products. We've got a couple more events coming up. Um, so 17th of December, uh, we're looking at building elements. So walls and building systems, roofing, that type of thing. And then in January, building services, and then the grand finale, uh, which will be uh, probably the 25th of February. Um, we've got our Healthy Buildings Expo and Conference, which will be online over two days, 24th, 25th of February. Stick it in your diary now, because uh, it will be a must-see event. Next week, we've got a, an update on the ICE database. That's, that's inventory of uh, carbon and energy. So Craig Jones, uh, is introducing all the work that he's been doing on updating the ICE database. Anderson, who's the UK's, I think, sort of uh, expert on life cycle analysis. Um, so please join us for that. And in two weeks' time, we've got a reuse summit. Um, and uh, I really like the way that Catherine's put this programme together. Um, so we'll be talking through all the various who um, to talk to that. So that'd be fun. That's free. Um, so join us for that. There's a, a, a summary of those events there. And um, we're a, a partner in a, a European project. Uh, it's called BioCERC. So I'm delighted to be still uh, in the EU uh, as we leave the EU. And uh, colleagues from France. 
And um, so do get involved with the ASBP, join up as a member, sign up to our free mailing list. We don't bombard you with stuff. Uh, it's just a monthly newsletter. We've got sponsorship opportunities. We've got a range of special working groups. Uh, so uh, the Reducing Plastics in Construction is one of those groups. And uh, have a look at our forthcoming events up on our website. So that's me. So thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over to Catherine now to take us through our Reducing Plastics in Construction Working Group and uh, ask her just to show a few slides on what we've been up to uh, in that group and um, um, take it away. Catherine, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to spend the next five minutes just quickly talking you through the Plastics Group, um, which this innovation pitch series come, comes out from. So I, I look after the group in a, in a technical manner. Um, we've been set up for about two years ago. And when we first got together, we looked at what um, all the people in the room and what their commonality of interests were. You can see a list there. So it's very much looking at ways we can move away from plastic where appropriate, what the alternatives are, um, also looking at single use and the issues related to that and um, health and safety, as well as sort of having a better understanding of what happens to plastic at, it, at end of life and when it becomes a waste. Um, so we're very much collaborative. We're cross supply chain. So we've got manufacturers, architects, contractors, end of life. Um, we're small um, and nimble. We want to keep it that way because because we can get more done that way. Very much solution orientated. So it's identifying challenges and then seeing what practical actions we can do about that. We know a lot's happening in the plastic space as well. So we don't want to be duplicative. We do want to um, collaborate and um, link to other initiatives where where relevant and also look to do um, funding bids when appropriate. Um, and then you can see our membership there. Um, if you do want to um, get more involved, do get in touch with us. Um, and as Simon said, three of our members are judges today. So that's great. Um, so some of the things, and some of the judges may talk about this, so I'll go very quickly. Jess has done, um, really good work in her local community of Bath, trying to engage businesses and communities into, into looking at plastic and Accord Housing. Um, they're looking at projects to develop uh, plastic-free housing. They may even be on ground now, I think, so that's good. And then we have members that are offering alternative to plastic products. So these are a few examples in sort of windows, guttering and tubes, for instance. Um, so as I said, we're very much solution orientated and output focused. Um, we've done quite a few things now and we, and we continue to do them. So um, we've done a number of site visits to educate ourselves. We've done an introduction guide, which I'll show in a minute, open source online map to show who's doing what in, in this area. Um, very much about engaging with supply chain in terms of what alternatives there are, um, are they fit for purpose? hosting a Dragon's Den style event. So this is the innovation pitch series today. And then last but not least, once we identify alternatives, can we then look at ways of piloting and trialing them to make, to make sure that they work? Um, so as I said, we've done, we've, I think this has been active for around a year now. It's quite a fun little map with lots of nodes that interconnect. Um, and it basically shows you stakeholders who are working in this area and then also the activities as well. So the activities could be reports, events, medias, project, projects. And um, we're always sort of updating this. So if anyone has got anything to add to it or they think anything's missing, just, just just let us know. Um, this has been, uh, I think, since April or June. I can't quite remember now. Um, so we've made this live. It's free to download on our website. And it really is, uh, it is what it says, an introductory guide to plastics in construction. So it just presents a bit of um, background to why it's important, some of the figures, what are the issues related to it? Where are the alternatives? Who's doing what? What we're doing? And then some of the drivers. We are looking at updating this. So again, if anyone 
wants to have a look at it and provide us um, with some feedback, that would be uh, appreciated. And there you go. So it works in an interactive PDF style. So if I click on a question, a new, a new window will come up and we've tried to sort of um, link to other relevant information where possible. Um, so as Simon said, this is our third innovation pitch series out of five in total. The first one was in insulation and you can see the winner there. So all this, um, I think some of the, uh, you can look at these if you, did, if, you, if you didn't manage to attend in the first place, they are available on our website. Our second one was on packaging. We had two different winners there. We had Treetop Biopack as the judges winner and we had the Magical Mushroom Company as the audience winner there. And as Simon said, we've got further two, one in December, one in January, and then looking at having that healthy building um, conference as a finale where the winners will all present together and there'll be one overall winner. Uh, Simon's already mentioned this, just to say it feeds into our plastic work because it's looking at um, polyester duvets. So it's, it's looking more at the sort of the fiberization and how we can include some of that into um, new insulation products. That's it from me. So uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Do get in touch with any of us if you'd like more information. We're, we're a friendly bunch. <laughs> so good luck to the pictures. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. That's excellent. Great. All right. Well, uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first judge this morning. So Carl Taylor's director at Accord Housing. So Carl, if I can ask you to share your screen and show us a few slides. So uh, Accord Housing is uh, uh, leading uh, the way. They're developing 12 plastic free houses. And um, I'm very much looking forward to getting a bit of an update on to uh, where uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, as Simon said, I'm Carl Taylor from Accord House Association uh, and we are at the moment trying to build uh, what we think is the UK's first 12 virtually plastic free uh, apartments uh, and we also think it's probably the first 12 in Europe uh, because it is a European funded project we have got support from Interreg Northwest Europe as part of their charm project which is looking at circularity in housing. Oh, sorry, apologies. Um, and, and I suppose the first question is, why are we looking at doing virtually plastic free housing? I'm probably speaking to a converted audience here, but the point is we can't continue building, uh, can't continue business as usual and building as usual. Accord for a long time has tried to be an innovator in low carbon and in the green agenda. Uh, and we were one of the first organisations to develop uh, low carbon housing and we went on to open our own factory that was building low carbon housing uh, but then there were some roadworks on the M5 uh, and we were all sat on the M5 in a traffic jam looking at a picture of a turtle eating a plastic bag and realizing that the low carbon housing we were, we were building was just putting a plastic uh, membrane around every house that we did and we decided to see if we could remove that and produce some more natural produce homes using more natural materials the reason for that is quite simple. Uh, although people think we th think that uh, houses are there forever and a day, and that the plastic components uh, don't really matter because they'll be there for the next 150 years, the reality is that homes are continually being updated and, mon uh, and, and modified, and that lots of the things that we put in a house that are plastic will end up in landfill uh, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, of the 9 billion tonnes of plastic the world has produced, um, uh, so, so of the 400 million tonnes of plastic that's produced every year, at the moment there are 9 billion tonnes of plastic that's being produced and the world has only uh, recycled 9% of that. Uh, and in the houses we see things like the heating system, the kitchen, the bathrooms, the windows and the doors, that are all components that are replaced in a relatively short lifetime of a house, uh, which all have plastic elements which tend to end up going into landfill, uh, into the oceans uh, and into that turtle for the want of a better description. Um, so we set about identifying a site. The site that we've identified is in that red line there. It's in Redditch, right by the train station. So it's a very prominent, uh, high profile site and will be very easily accessed by public transport. Um, 
and that is the plan showing the 12 apartments that we are going to build on the site uh, and that's the more detailed layout drawing of it that we submitted to planning um, so we've achieved planning permission on the site we have started on site but at the moment uh, I'm afraid we're still in the ground uh, and setting up the compound and all of that sort of stuff uh, and we have a 12 month build program which means we should be completing September 21 uh, and the interreg project itself will complete a year later giving us a year to promote and publicize uh, what we've achieved uh, if we have achieved um, which I'm certainly hope we'll do. That's what the building will look like on the left. Uh, it will be front of road now with balconies uh, and um, no plastic, uh, uh, which is the significant thing for us. So, so what are we replacing? Well, we, try, we set ourselves a really ambitious goal of trying to replace everything, uh, I have to say, uh, and we failed uh, to be able to replace uh, everything. Uh, we've done some. We, we, we've, we, we've gone on a learning journey. We've managed to find ways of changing the uh, cabling in the house, so the electric cabling and all the cabling. We've managed to remove plastic from the cabling, uh, but we haven't managed to remove plastic from the switch gear and switches and sockets and consumer boards. Uh, we've managed to remove plastic and those uh, vapor barriers that we first thought about as being the problem uh, in the insulation and the walls of our timber frame building. Uh, and we've managed to remove plastic from the uh, kitchen and bathrooms of the property and we've managed to reduce the plastic in the MVHR units so there's none on the outside or the ducts but there's still a little bit in the electrical stuff inside the the metal box uh, and we've managed to remove plastic from the heating system uh, and from the paint in the property uh, but there are some areas where we think further work is needed where we haven't come up with a solution that's enabled us to be plastic free so first of all, in fire protection, we're building 12 apartments uh, and around the windows and doors, there are intermittent strips, intermittent strips for fire protection. Uh, and those intermittent strips are, are plastic by their very nature. And we haven't managed to find a material that does the same thing uh, that is plastic. Uh, likewise, uh, we are in an area where halcyon gas rises up from the ground, odorless, colourless uh, and, and can do all sorts of nasty things including killing people uh, if it's not protected and guarded against uh, and we haven't found an effective gas mem membrane to put underneath the building that meets legislative uh, requirements that isn't uh, plastic. Um, we have used um, insulation that is uh, timber based uh, but we were surprised at the levels of plastic that was still in all of the insulations that we looked at that thought would be simple. When we looked at this, we thought the insulation would be the easiest thing to find uh, available on the market. We'd previously done code six level, code level six homes that were sheep's wool insulation, and we thought we would just use that. Uh, and we were surprised at the level of uh, plastic that were in those things and, and therefore failed the, the, the stringent standard that we'd set ourselves around plastic. And so we have got insulation that is virtually plastic free, but there is still a small uh, 0, 0.0 something uh, element of plastic within the insulation that we're using. We haven't found any electric switch gear that isn't plastic that is affordable. We found some fancy ceramic switches uh, that had no plastic components in it in them, but they were £80 uh, a pop um, or, or a switch. Uh, and clearly uh, that was beyond our budget, so we couldn't afford uh, the fancy ceramic uh, switches. Um, and so there is a gap in the market for somebody to produce uh, affordable non-plastic electric switches and sockets if anybody has got uh, an entrepreneurial uh, verve amongst us. And likewise, uh, we haven't managed to convince the utility meters uh, that they should replace their plastic utility meters with a non-plastic uh, alternative. We can get metal boxes around the utility meters so that they can be housed in something that's not plastic, but we can't get uh, the actual utility meters themselves to be non-plastic. So although we set ourselves a high ambition and we're falling short of that, I think you can see from what we are changing and the work that we've done there, that we've gone a long way to trying to um, achieve our virtually plastic free house and that it will be virtually plastic free with just a few legislative requirements that have required some elements of plastic within the building. 
this is what the building will look like uh, when it's completed. Um, it will have a, um, a cladding that is timber uh, on its exterior. It will have insulation that's, in, in, that, 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 that's timber uh, inside it. It will look and feel to the people using it very much like a real house, uh, like a normal house, uh, except it will have a dramatically less uh, amount of plastic within it than would otherwise be the case if we were building it. We've got a number of outcomes that are going to come from that. The timber frame that we're using uh, is saving 65 tonnes of material from being uh, downcycled by the reuse of the timber uh, elements. There are 125 tonnes that have been recycled from demolition works across the site. So if I go back, uh, you can see on the left hand side of the road in the bottom right hand corner picture, there are some more new houses being built. We're also building that as part of a regeneration project for the town centre of Redditch uh, and we're using material from there to recycle onto our uh, site where we're building the virtually plastic free houses. Um, and uh, there will be 15 tonnes of material in the house that will be able to be reused afterwards. Uh, we think we're producing what will be a really splendid house with lots of innovation in that reduces the use of plastic uh, and uh, I suppose in terms of our agenda here in these um, innovation series is that whilst we have a general specification as you've seen from what I've talked about how we're going to achieve our house uh, because we're still at a point where we're in the ground if somebody can really inspire us then there is still an opportunity for us to pilot, pilot it in our new houses uh, and something that we'd be interested in taking forward. So, so, so we're here, not just as Dragon, but also as potential purchaser. Thank you. How do I end screen? Oh, I've got, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, Carl. Uh, this, uh, we're going to be working with Carl over the next couple of years and uh, offering updates uh, through the project. So um, there's a tremendous amount of learning that we're going to be sharing uh, from that project. Really, really exciting, sort of groundbreaking, really, as far as I'm concerned. So thank you, Carl. That's excellent. So um, we've got a question. Has anyone, uh, someone's asked if uh, uh, we're going to record this event. So yes, we are recording it and we will send you a recording of it so you can watch on catch up. So thanks for your question, Kate. So Carol is a dear colleague of ours um, from Cullinan Studios. Uh, so we share an office in normal times, uh, but uh, at the moment we're all working remotely uh, and we're missing that buzz of, um, uh, of seeing everybody and chatting over lunch. But Carol, if I can ask you and uh, give us an introduction to yourself and, and uh, your work. Thank you very much. Okay, hi, I'm Carol Costello. I'm an architect and one of three practice leaders at Cullinan Studio. And I've got a few short slides, really just a kind of quick update of news from Cullinan's and um, latest thinking, really. I'll share my screen now. And Can you see that? Oops. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Is it there? Okay. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say a bit about, um, sorry, get that out of the way. Uh, 2020, I mean, what a year for everyone. Um, I suppose one of the things that's been interesting for us is we've been recognized for some of our achievements of projects built before 2020. So we're really proud um, that our Bunhill Energy Center on the City Road in Islington recently won the NLA Environmental Prize. And for um, any of you who might know about this project or not, it takes waste heat from the London Underground and uses that heat for a district heat network and the heat pump and technology can be reversed to provide cooling to the London underground. So that, that's being recognized for its innovation. Also our National Automotive Innovation Center at University of Warwick has just in the last few weeks won some really uh, quite prestigious awards. And we're really proud of the, that because 
probably all, everyone in the practice worked on that in some way. And I led the workplace and interior design on that project. And then um, our project at I, RHS Hyde Hall in Essex, I encourage anyone to get out there if you wanna break from your home working and need to get out in nature, beautiful gardens they have there. But we did the hilltop buildings, um, with a new Clor Learning Center and a restaurant, and that's re received a Civic Trust Award this year. So we're proud of that, and we want to build on that. Um, I suppose another thing we've been working on over about a year and a half is just kind of redefining our purpose and galvanizing our team to address the really urgent issues we've got at the moment of um, climate change, but since we've been having this conversation, we've also got a pandemic. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement we're seeing affect our team and also our clients. So we've got these five themes, connection to nature, powerful communities, healthy buildings, circular economy, future streets. And it's really building on the things that we're good at anyway. So trying to have an impact where we're best experienced to do that. And um. So as Simon said, we have our lovely studio on the canal. And um, one of the things we've done there uh, is create a kind of gorilla garden on the towpath. And it's been quite um, profound, the effect it's had on the local community and on us as um, tenants of the building. And um, it's, I think it's what we're finding is that our work has always had um, landscape, plants, living walls, green roofs uh, integrated into it as kind of part of our DNA. But what we're finding is it's becoming much more of an urgent issue for society and that there's a lot of scientific research now to say how much nature impacts our health. And particularly in urban areas, finding little strips and continuities for nature to be integrated is very important. And it's something that's coming up our agenda at Cullinan Studio. And a bit about uh, powerful communities. I mean, we see that as the way we um, treat our, ourselves in our practice. We're cooperative, so we all treat each other with respect. We're very transparent. We know our income um, and share that together. Um, but we also extend that to whoever we work with. And one of the things we're really proud of is our outreach to um, maybe less represented groups and trying to mentor young people who traditionally don't take roots into architecture. Um, one thing I would say about this is we're finding on a lot of public procurement projects, particularly with local authorities and housing associations, we're being asked to to show our, our diversity figures. Um, we have over the last 25 years transformed the practice from mostly white male architects to being almost 50-50 female and we're about 26% non-white. And this is becoming an issue for our clients who want an ethical supply chain. So all the good things we've been doing over the years seem to be turning our way in terms of um, clients who need to show ethical procurement. And that goes for the university sector as well. And um, healthy buildings is obviously a theme that um, we shared with uh, the Alliance of Sustainable Building Products and our retrofit studio is naturally ventilated, um, has good daylight, uh, try to use natural materials as much as we possibly can. Um, but uh, I think also we need to keep learning and improving the work we've been doing on plastics and construction with the ASBP is very interesting. And I think it's given everyone in the practice a new awareness of what can we do to kind of um, think about plastic use in our own business, but also in the specification of uh, buildings. And it's fantastic to see the Accord project. It's just so inspiring, the research you've done. And I think we can all learn a lot from that, Carl. Um, and on circular economy, I mean, this touches so many things. Uh, 
obviously we know that retrofit is really important that we've got to reuse our, our building stock as an asset, as a material store, et cetera. So that's got to be the first point of reference and then seeing how we can improve those to adapt to a low carbon future. But we're also doing a lot of work on just measuring um, carbon of the projects we've got on the boards, whether they have net zero targets or not. We've uh, got the whole practice involved in almost like a book club with the Letty Climate Emergency Design Guide, where we're doing um, talks with each other, understanding the uh, metrics, trying to become more carbon literate, and then compare the projects we've got against those um, metrics with, and targets within the Letty de Design Guide. Um, and the last one I was going to put on here was about future streets. Um, and we are really excited about um, the uh, research project we're doing for Innovate UK with about 25 partners, but it's um, London South Bank University leading the um, research program. And um, we're working with Islington Council and I mentioned our Bunhill Energy Center uh, at the beginning. Well, we've got another project where we're looking at a fifth generation heat network, which is a low temperature heat network, which takes waste heat, not only from London underground, but boreholes, data centers, supermarkets, and then provides that mostly to social housing in the area, but not not um, solely. So other people can buy into this. And it also connects with um, solar panels, electric vehicle charging, et cetera. So, but in doing this, we are really having to think about our streets because the, the heat network needs to go into the streets. So it's bringing up all sorts of issues about what's going on with COVID and the, the battle for space on our streets, for parking, for um, cycleways, um, for trees, for plants, and where are these pipes going to go? So we're doing a lot of really interesting research on that and trying to integrate greenery with the district heat network. So that's where Cullinan Studio is at the moment. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, really. Uh, Fantastic presentation. What a, what a great organization Cullinan Studios are. It's really considered architecture. It's um, fantastic to, uh, to be working quite closely with you guys. Um, well, thank you, Carol. Um, I'm going to push on now and introduce you to our last, our last judge this morning. So that's Jess. So Jess Riffnack, she's a Sustainable Development Advisor at REBA. She's an old colleague of mine, actually, from, from Bioregional. Um, so we've uh, known each other for quite a long time. Um, so Jess, I'm going to ask you to share your screen and um, introduce yourselves and all the work that you've been doing uh, on plastics and beyond. So thank you, Jess. Thanks very much for the introduction. Yes, um, Simon just said we, we have known each other for a, a, a long time and um, I've been really um, it's nice to be part of the Plastics and Construction Working Group, well, since it's um, first. Jess, day. you're a little bit quiet. You're a little yeah. bit quiet, Jess. Um, is that better? Can people hear me? A, a, bit, a little better. A little better. Maybe come in a bit more. Sorry. That's all right. Is that better? I don't know. That is better. That's so, yeah, thanks, Jess. Great. Oh, sorry about the camera. Um, so I was, yes, thank you very much. Um, really happy to be um, here. Um, I've been involved with the ASBP um, through the Plastics and Construction Group for the last two years. Um, currently working as a Sustainable Development Advisor with the RIBA. And also freelancing with materials. Just wanted to start off by sort of a pause for thought, why materials are important. Well, materials are really all around us, um, but the efficiency um, of our technological progress and this drive 
um, to build better and faster is at a real dichotomy um, with um, waste and convenience because this drive for progress comes at, at the cost of um, speed and time and convenience. We also see how our consumption um, speeds up and we have these, these scenes because we're, it's, time is of such essence that we can fall into this trap of waste generation. And we see that, you know, from, from the kind of coffee cup takeaway through to obviously on construction sites. And um, my background is in architecture. Um, and so materials have always been kind of at the forefront of my, um, my mind, also throughout my days as a consultant at Bioregion, also at Max Gordon. And this is really because I see very, you know, we, we want to create space from materials and the, the built environment is all, you know, it's a sum part of the, the, the small items, but we know how this feeds into um, the um, current um, climate emergency and the, and the current um, issues that we face at a global scale as well. And we know that um, building and materials and construction is responsible for a large um, portion of that pie. And when we look at um, embodied carbon, we also know, you know, that's a quarter of um, the annual global um, CO2 emissions. However, we also know that interplay between um, our choices of um, uh, materials um, will have, as Carol just showed us some fantastic pictures of the Cullinan Studios on the um, operational um, energy as well. And really, um, the R how, how is the RIBA doing um, working as trying to support the industry with that? Well, um, the RIBA was also declared a climate emergency a um, couple of days um, after the UK announced this um, very ambitious target for net zero. And as a part of a suite of um, documents really to help the um, whole in industry and also and particularly architects, um, thought about putting together some interim targets um, part of the RBA 2030 climate challenge. It is a, um, available on the internet. And these are not perfect targets, but they're um, really trying to put a, um, a line in the sand at the moment and with where we and interim targets to show the trajectory that we all need to um, take to tackle um, this crisis. So just to say that you know if we carry on as we are that is going to be completely unsustainable um, beyond 2030 and actually we need to be addressing these things right now um, to even have a hope of uh, meeting um, you know our our objectives and the these climate the the the, the 2030 um, challenge is supported by a suite of documents um, such as the RBA Sustainable Outcomes Guide, which is linked back to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, because we know that the um, greenhouse gases is one small aspect. We also have a biodiversity crisis, and how, as architects, um, you know, we need to think about all of those interconnected things. Carol was just very, very eloquently talking about the layers of the fight on the streets for space. You know, it's about a layering of, of all these issues, one on top of the other. So we're um, hoping to add to um, this with an illustrated guide of case studies. So I'm here also to, um, you know, um, put, put that out to you now, is if you've got some projects that you um, see that are really um, demonstrating um, the objectives of the Sustainable Outcomes Guide, please do get in touch. We're really looking for projects to share with the wider um, um, RIBA uh, membership. And my, pers uh, my personal interest, as um, Catherine said at the beginning, in um, plastics and construction. I've also um, 
boundary of Bath Ocean Plastic Day, which was an ed education and outreach event, um, which look, had a, a, a wide range of um, stakeholders from businesses to um, students and young people, really seeing them as the future and um, educating the next generation um, of people and inspiring them that science um, isn't boring, but can also be used to solve some of the um, current issues that we all face. Oh, Jess, well, brilliant. Thank you very much. Are you finished? Yes, I am. Lo lovely. Thank you very much. OK, so just had a quick question in from Mark Robinson, who asks, is the REBA Sustainable Outcomes Guide available to share? <clears throat> is that something you can put a link in the chat? Yes, I should put both of those um, into the chat. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Jess. So that's our three judges who will be breathing fire, um, not like dragons, of course, but like other mythical animals. Um, so um, without further ado, we're going to move on to our pitch element of the event this morning. So three fantastic doing. Um, so uh, we're going to work through our pitches. So first is Graffenstone. So we've got John Thurgood, who's joined us today. Um, so I'm going to ask Richard to um, play, uh, uh, we've got a two minute video to watch, so we're all going to watch the two minute video, I haven't seen this, so I'm looking forward to seeing it, and then we've got eight minutes of Q&A uh, with John to understand a bit more about the product and, and what, makes it, um, uh, 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 what, what makes it so good and why it should win today. So thank you Richard. Okay. Hello Dragons, my name is John Thurgood and I'm Head of Sales for a company called Graffenstone UK. The Graffenstone paint range is a 100% natural, sustainable paint system, based on a revolutionary fusion of mineral bases, mostly lime and silica, and graphene, the revolutionary 21st century super material. We are one of the most eco-friendly and healthy paint companies on the market today, with a robustness often only associated with that of modern acrylic paints. Graffenstone uses one of the oldest and most traditional of all building materials, lime, as the base ingredient to our natural mineral coatings. Lime absorbs carbon dioxide as it cures, at a rate of up to 5.5 kilos per 15 litre pot, improving the air quality around us and assisting us all towards the ultimate target of carbon neutrality. The other naturally occurring properties of lime are numerous and include zero toxicity, plastics, petrochemicals and VOCs, naturally antibacterial and mould resistant, fully breathable and completely non-combustible. At Graffenstone we have brought this forgotten material back into the 21st century by fusing graphene with the natural but normally delicate minerals, enhancing the performance dramatically to become a viable alternative to the modern plastic paints. Adding graphene brings strength, durability, flexibility and increased surface adhesion whilst taking nothing away from the positive properties of the natural minerals. As well as absorbing carbon dioxide, we also have a paint that will neutralise airborne pollutants, including nitrous oxide, sulphur oxide and other VOCs, which improve health and well-being and the air that we breathe. And containing no acrylics means our paints are completely plastic free and will not degrade and break down and introduce microplastics into our waterways and oceans like modern paints can. Our paints have achieved the highest recognised environmental standards, with over 18 international certifications, including Cradle to Cradle Gold, Eurofins Indoor Air Comfort Gold, Well, Lee and Bria. Our paints meet the principles of a circular economy, and it is in our DNA to be an innovator and a creator of ecological and respectful products for people and the planet. The negative effects caused by modern paints have been overlooked for far too long, and it is up to us to force change by offering viable alternatives with equal or better performance, in keeping with modern attitudes towards health and the planet, and by offering paints for the green generation. Thanks so much for listening. Great, so really interesting video, uh, nice looking product. So 
perhaps I can ask all our dragons to take themselves off mute. And um, so I'm looking at Jess rather than um, rather than looking at John. So John, uh, let me ask you a question. And as you speak, we'll flip back to you. So how uh, are your paints made in the UK or whereabouts are they manufactured? No, great question. Um, going back to what you're saying about the European uh, part of today, um, our paints are manufactured in a little village called El Viso, just outside of Seville in Spain. Um, that's pretty much where the raw materials Lovely. come from. So that, that's why that location is there. But they do go to, they're becoming a pretty global brand now. And I think they've got distribution in 45 countries, um, including the UK now. Okay, fantastic. So over to you, uh, judges. So uh, is any, just pitch in. So Carol, Jess, Carl. So Carol, off you go. Um, well, as an architect. Yeah, please just go far away. Uh, working with clients, um, they'll have uh, their own uh, preoccupations and sometimes that will be cost quite often. Of sometimes it might be, you know, the colours range. Can you tell us a bit more about how that might compare with Ferro and Ball or other types of manufacturers who uh, are sometimes desired by our clients? Of course, yes. Um, colour is always one of the main driving forces with paint choice. Um, the ecological aspects and the, the other positive things that brands such as Graffenstein can bring are sometimes a bonus for people, um, but also sometimes the leading side of things. So it's important to be really, really strong from a colour perspective because design does lead the way more often than not. Um, we have a rather attractive house colour card, which is very similar to what you would expect from the likes of the Farron Balls of the world. Uh, that has 96 uh, beautiful house colours on there, but we also have access to a thousand colours from a chart which is quite historical called the NCS colour chart, um, widely used in the industry by all the main players, such as your Axe and Abels, your Crown Paints. Um, and in theory, we can actually produce anything on colour. So we do bespoke copies, bespoke matching. So if somebody has a fabric or a particular colour they would like to copy, we can do that reasonably quickly uh, and pretty cost efficiently as well. So colour really for us is, is one of our strong points behind all of our um, USPs and, and uh, positive parts of our product. Um, price point is obviously, you raised that issue there, um, incredibly important for mass change that price is the least obstacle as possible or the least um, problematic. And from a price point perspective, we're probably, we situate ourselves quite uniquely somewhere between trade paints, which is mass used, and designer paints, which is mass desired. So depending on your audience some will see us as an expensive product some will see us as a, a, a refreshingly cheap product um, by, by no stretch of the imagination is it unachievable um, from a from a budget perspective we did address um, the, the the premium nature of the, of the price point by introducing a low cost economic version of our products um, there's a product called Nevada Ultra which is a natural mineral zero VOC product plastic free um, for mass use, designed for sort of mass construction, that sort of thing. And it's about a third of the cost of the rest of our range. So I'd like to think we have a price point suitable for, for most budgets. That's great. I suppose the other side with that is if you're paying more, people might want to know a bit more about the um, durability. If you have to paint less often, then maybe the cost works out over time. Absolutely. Yeah, so How easy it is to clean. Absolutely. So one of the major um, marketing parts of what we have, uh, we're quite in it. We have a big piece of innovation called graphene technology. Um, graphene is becoming sort of widely recognized as probably the best invention of our lifetimes. And I think the world is in a little bit of a gray area of how best to use it, but they understand the principles of how advantageous it can be. Uh, we add graphene fibers to all of our all of our paints for one specific reason. Um, and that is a microscopic nano level support network for minerals, um, which traditionally have been quite loose, brittle, friable, and not particularly long lasting. So mineral paints are nothing new. Um, they've been around for, for centuries, mm -hmm. but they've been brushed aside by the advancements of modern acrylics and solvent based paints down to durability and longevity and cost. Um, graphene 
sort of winds the clock back a little bit because it brings these these softer sort of friable coatings it gives them a strength and, and rigidity and flexibility to compete with modern products and i think that's such an important message that sustainability shouldn't come that shouldn't come at a compromise um so for me, one of the major points of what we do is we offer people a viable alternative without compromise. And it is purely the graphene in the material that allows us to do that. The other major advantage is graphene takes away nothing from what we have with these natural minerals. So the carbon dioxide from the lime um, and just the, the natural sustainable nature of what we use, graphene doesn't take anything away. It just adds more positives to that. It's a real, real, a real uh, advancement for us. I want to ask one last question. Is sure. just uh, can I just interrupt, <laughs> Carol? Yeah. Just, just, just so please, guys, uh, in our audience, please uh, ask your questions in the Q and A. Um, so we may <coughs> not have time to answer them all live, um, but what we're going to do is ask John to then go back to the Q and A and ask and answer them directly. Yeah, sorry, um, so I'll sorry, give Carol. You. Excuse me for being. Rude. No, 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 you carry on hogging it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, last question. Like it's hot. <laughs> Is there a Are lot? you going to ask a question, Carol? Yeah. Oh, just about yeah, recycling the pots. Yeah, Jess, no, you go. You go. You... Sorry, I okay, didn't recycling didn't the pots. Or maybe we're not... recycling the paint pot. Yeah, so. so um... was John. Yeah, this, this comes up a little bit actually with, oh, yes. with what we do. The the containers that we use for our paints are in plastic, which is always a conversational piece. Um, the plastic is made from, the pots are made from 100% recycled plastic and they are 100% recyclable as with all of our packaging materials. So we've done everything we possibly can to address this issue and long-term goals for us are paint can back schemes, uh, reuse schemes, that sort of thing. So. The logistics of doing that in the short term are difficult. Um, we rely very much on a distribution network or, or the end user recycling the product, which I think is a problem that everybody faces in all levels of industry and, and retail. Um, but there is the there is the potential to have a completely circular process with this um, once we have an effective distribution network across the entire country and ultimately from a Graffenstone perspective across the world. So. The, the, the foundations have been laid for that to be absolutely a possibility um, or, or 100% can happen. It's just the logistics of it, which is the challenge at the moment. But um, the important message that we always put out is, is everything is recyclable and recycled um, to the best of our ability. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Jess. That's brilliant. Sorry, Jess, yeah, yeah, just, just pipe in. Jess, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so obviously, um, over the last few years, um, the standards of paint have also been catching up on this ground. Um, and I would like to hear from you um, what are you know, quantifiably the differences between your, your the standard VOC content of um, you know a so-called mainstream paint brand and your offering. Um, what do you see your, the differences? Being. Yeah, great question. Um, I think VOCs up until recently have been not very well understood. Um, people heard the phrase, didn't they really know what it means? And they didn't realise the impact that perhaps that building materials and paint in particular have on the on the living environment around us. And it's to class something as zero VOC is actually an impossibility. Um, we, we do sometimes use that terminology, because, but unfortunately there are VOCs released from pretty much everything, um, naturally occurring sometimes as well. But we are as close to the zero mark as, as, as possible from a paint perspective. Um, the only way we can achieve that is by using the core ingredients that we use. So the, the mineral contents so limes, calcium silicates, mixed minerals, clays. They, they just don't produce anything. Um, when you compare that to a mass, produ mass producer, we all know who they are, so let's not name them. Um, they are using acrylic-based products. They're using sulfur-based products with different core ingredients that, that produce the level of VOC, which could never be as close to zero as what we are getting to. Um, there's no doubt that the larger manufacturers could make changes, and I think they are making changes. Um, there, there was a massive legislation change in 2010 um, mainly sort of linked to solvent-based paints. That's a huge step in the right direction. Um, but as a sector, it's still woefully 
behind where it should be. Um, I mean, this is 2020. We have all the technology available to us um, to, to make the changes needed, and it's still not happened. So the healthy nature of what we have, right from the outset, it was, it was the goal to produce the healthiest possible products uh, out there. And that is why the journey took us down the mineral paint route. Because if you look at other mineral paints in the, in the marketplace, and there are a few, they all have one thing in common. They're incredibly healthy and incredibly sustainable. Um, so getting to the lowest point possible then allows you to spread your wings and actually improve things in certain other areas. So we have USP such as uh, carbon dioxide absorption um, through the curing period. We have products that will absorb airborne contaminants and pollution such as nitrous oxide and sulfur oxides. And we've only been able to go down that route because of the materials that we use. Now, the main players could never do that with their products. It would be very, very difficult um, because of their ingredients and the mass, mass produced product. Um, but there is a noticeable difference still, but it is getting closer. Okay. Look, um, really, really fascinating. Uh, thank you so, so much. I'm really sorry, Carl, but we've run out of time. Um, so I'm mindful of the clock. It's against us. So if you've got any pressing questions, everybody, including Carl, if you can put them in the Q&A, and then I can ask John to spend a, bit, a, little, a little bit of time over the next presentations um, to answer those questions to everybody's um, liking. And we'll send a copy of the Q&A to everybody uh, with the recording after the event. So thank you ever so much, John. No problem, thank you. I think we should do a, a, a much longer presentation um, because this is a, a subject close to my heart. Yeah. So now uh, we've got Aaron Smith from Solar Ceramics. So we're gonna listen to two minutes from uh, him and then we've got some Q&A with, uh, with Aaron. So thank you, Richard. Hi, my name's Aaron Smith from Solus. I'm the area sales manager for engineered hard flooring. Biopolyurethane and cork. At Solus, we have four main priorities. These are quality, sustainability, performance, and value for money. I'm here today to tell you about two lesser known products in the marketplace that we feel in today's ever changing world are becoming more and more important. The first one being organic flooring. Organic flooring is made up of three simple ingredients castor oil, canola oil, and chalk. It can be installed domestically and commercially, it comes in a roll plank and tile format, and those are over 120 different decors, so really versatile for any installation. The product itself is special because it contains absolutely zero plastic. It gets graded zero on VOCs, which means no harmful chemicals or smells come from the product, and also has a commercial wear layout with an antibacterial top. The second product I would like to tell you about is cork. Cork is the most sustainable product we can use as it's just bark of a tree. The tree itself is harvested every nine years, however, is never cut down in its life cycle. It has amazing thermal and acoustic values. Cork's Achilles Hill has always been moisture and its decals. With advancements in technology, it brings us hydrocork. Hydrocork is no longer affected by moisture and also with advancements in printing technology, it means that digital printing is available on it so you can have stone effects and wood planks and loads of different options to go with. It also carries a commercial wear layer. Something I would like to you to take away today is that in one square meter of normal LVT is the equivalent to 2,360 plastic straws. Yet no one thinks to think of this when they walk over the products under their feet. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you all have a good day. Okay, thank you very much. That was a really interesting pitch there from Aaron. So Aaron, if I can ask you to take yourself off mute and put your camera on. And I'm going to hand over to Carl to ask the first question, uh, because uh, I fear that uh, I missed you last time around. So Carl, is there any questions there that you have for Aaron? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. The organic flooring uh, using the, the, the oils. What's yep. the production process for that and what carbon footprint does it come out as okay um so certification wise it carries cradle to cradle and um, the production process all of the energy used in production is um they have a solar farm and it's generated from wind farm so all of the um production itself is net zero okay. and is it, a, <laughs> is it a, in the cooking production process is, is that is Paul Spears off mute because he'd be perfect to uh, answer this question. 
<laughs> so, yeah. Um, it, it is like a cooking process, but it's not, again, a big pot. It's almost, if you've ever seen linoleum being made, mm -hmm. it's quite similar. So it's basically the, the ingredients come in silos and then they're all put together and under temperature or high temperature and pressure, they form the product. Fantastic. But the other thing is, uh, is the factories in a small village in Germany and the additional electricity that they produce, they use it for the rest of the community. Okay, thank you. And um, if there was one thing okay, you Okay, thanks change... Paul, thanks Carl. Okay. Please, please carry on. Please okay. carry on. If there was one thing you would please carry on about the product, what would that be? Um, the price. And <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, and 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 what sort of price point does it fall in at the moment then? It's about twenty percent more than vinyl, which we don't think is that important, but uh, most builders think that it is because they don't really care. <laughs> Um, it's yeah, it's yeah. not that much more, but it also outperforms vinyl because it's not susceptible to heat, so it doesn't shrink and swell. Um, it also, if it's dented, basically what it'll do is recover the indentation itself, which vinyl doesn't do. So it's got lots of advantages in performance and with the environment, but it comes at a slightly higher cost. Thank you. So your houses would love it. Uh, we'll have a chat afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Okay, sounds good. Sound positive. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Jess, sorry, go on. Yeah. So, um, you know, it sounds great. Yeah, um, please, Jess. I'd love to see some pictures of the process. Um, how do you transport it um, from factory to site, um, given that a flooring, you know, is it? it you know, tends to become very over-packaged. Um, how have you um, packaged it so that it, you, you protect the um, product? Okay, so the, oh, go on, Paul. Right, right. No, you go, it's your turn. Okay, so the, um, the rolls and plank and tile format all come in um, cardboard sheeting, so they don't use any plastic on it itself. Um, the way we do it is we bring it all into our central warehouse in Birmingham, so there's not, single deliveries going on lorries that we can't control and then we um, send it out from there using all silver and gold standard lorries to the best of our ability. Paul if there's anything you want to add to that. No it's it basically it's recycled cardboard is what it's packed in. Okay great Jess any other further questions? Yes, adhesives. So yeah, how, please. How, how, how um, do you have, you know, how do you um, put lay the, the stuff? Because obviously some, you know, you can have a, a fantastic finish, but then um, it be glued um, and which renders it unusable. Um, you can't take it up, you can't move it, um, but also resin, you know, any, any kind of glue is, uh, potentially um, quite noxious and toxic. Um, so do you have a range that you recommend or are there other ways of, of fixing it and laying it? Who's taking this one, Paul, you or me? <laughs> uh, you go first. <laughs> okay, um, so we have a full list of approved manufacturers, um, people like Ardex, Mapai, the uh, pretty much the the staple force of installing. Um, yes, that is, in honesty, yeah, it's the main issue with the product is once you adhere something to it, that is now part of the product. Um, they do make it in a click system, so it's available, so you can float it, so you don't actually need to adhere it down to the floor, um, which makes the product itself a lot more, let's call it recyclable in its end format. Okay, thank you very much. Any final questions, Jess? 
no, she's ignoring me. So, Carol. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Thanks, Jess. Carol. Just a little bit more on durability. Do you have a, a standard kind of, uh, if, say if it was laid in a school, how long would you expect that floor to, to last? At least as long as a current vinyl floor. So it's got no less performance in a vinyl floor, but it's hard to say how long it'll last because it'll wear out faster in a corridor than it would say in a classroom, but it'll last at least as long as a, a, a traditional vinyl floor. So the, there's um, one good point about that is, you know, when you go into like schools and hospitals, you see the sheen on the floor, which is like a sealer that they add to it with the organic flooring, because it's got the antibacterial top, it can't take any sealers at all. Um, so the main issue with adult asthma cases, which are led to 30% contribution to this, is sealers and strippers that are actually used on floor. So VOCs wise, you could have a per product that is absolutely perfect, contains, or like we were saying earlier, almost zero, and then go add a sealer to it and then use chemical strippers after. So they've designed the product so it doesn't work with them. It works independently. So the other thing is that most of the manufacturers of vinyl flooring put a coat of polyurethane on the surface for the, mm -hmm. to make it easier to maintain and also for wearability. Our product is a bio polyurethane. So the entire wear surface is polyurethane. So ergo it should last longer, but we're not going to say that it'll last for a hundred years, but it'll last at least as long as a, a vinyl floor. What's the oldest installation you know of of this product? The product wasn't invented until about 10 years ago. Okay, no, that's... Yeah. that's Thank so you. Basically everything that Aaron's promoted are products that are similar to old fashioned products, mm -hmm. but they use new technology to make them perform better. Like cork has always been sustainable product, but performance wise, people don't like it because it swells when it gets wet um, and it's brown. Um, now it doesn't have to look like cork and it performs like a, an LVT or even a real wooden floor. Well, it'd be great if you put a link to those products. In yeah, the no problem. Yeah, sure. I mean, in the chat. Yep. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Carol. I've got a couple of questions coming uh, on the Q and A. So keep your questions coming in, everybody. Um, so we're going to ask Aaron and Paul to uh, answer any unanswered questions. So there's a quick one from Tom Rag from Accord. Hi, Tom. So he's asked, what's the click system made of? So perhaps if I can ask Aaron and Paul to respond to that. Do you want us to write in the chat or say it out now? Or do both? Well, if you can say it out loud, um, uh, yeah, do both, actually. I'm sorry to make you work twice as hard, but um, <laughs> that'd be great. So if you can just vocally respond uh, and, and then... Uh, it's quite good to have it in the chat because it's a permanent record as well. Yeah, sure. Not a problem. So the, um, the click system is made out of the exact same material okay. called Ecuran. Um, it is just the castor oil, canola oil and chalk. Um, I will put a link in the chat as well so um, people can have a little bit more in-depth look at the product itself. So basically profile the core of the product rather than add something to it. Okay, can you put, yeah, pop up. Yeah, I'll dig that. I'll dig it out now and stick it in the chat for you. Okay, lovely. It's in the Q and A rather than the chat for us, because um, so the Q and A is is the uh, best place for those links. Thanks. Yeah, sure. All right, yeah. gentlemen, that's fantastic. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciated your contribution. So exciting product. So I very much like the sound of that. I'd like to know a bit more about it. Ten minutes is not really enough, is it? <laughs> um, so thank you for your questions, judges um so um all right so uh and we're going to move on without further ado so uh uh keeping uh, the international fit to ask uh, matthias potmeyer to uh, put his camera on 
So we're going to listen to a video from Haro for a couple of minutes and then take some questions uh, and put those to Matthias. So thank you, Richard. Okay, thank you very much. Quite an entertaining video there. Uh, so uh, welcome, Matthias. Thank you very much for joining us from Germany today. And so um, without f further ado, I'm going to hand you over to our dragon. So perhaps I'll start with Carol this time and ask you to just ask a couple of questions and, um, and then we'll pass on to the rest of the dragons. So thank you, Carol. Yes, hi, and thanks for that fun video. Uh, <laughs> I always hate that the mom is yeah. there, you know. <laughs> um, so, I know. <laughs> um, I'd like to know a little bit more about the timber species and where it's source. It's actually it's actually not timber, it's PET. So um, what I was about to say in the in the entry was like uh, when we consider plastics, I think we have to consider what kind of plastic uh, we're using and are we talking about, because there are plastics that are easily or more easily, way more easily recyclable than uh, the, for example, PVC plastics. Um, so I think we have to differentiate uh, a bit there. Um, so it's, thank you, because I designed the decor, so it's obviously um, quite realistic. Um, so um, yeah, it's basically about the recycling part there. So can you just say a bit more about that product, the PET? Yeah, sure. So it's a um, it's a product mainly made well almost completely from P PET. So that's the same uh, plastics, obviously that's used on the plastic bottles, for example. And uh, most of uh, the PET is uh, being recycled. Um, what um, yeah, the, the, the good thing about the product is actually that um, the, um, the core, the, the core uh, product value side, like, uh, like the soft, silent, durable, things like this, uh, makes it easily comparable to a PVC product or classic, classical uh, LVT product. So um, we, we come from, uh, we come from a, a parquet manufacturer. So like we are a parquet manufacturer. And from 2011 on, we have seen... Uh, a constant trend towards LVT and to using 
uh, PVC products, which are um, really difficult to uh, recycle and really difficult to use in a, in a building environment, in my opinion. Um, it's, well, wrong, wrongly said, it's easy to use, but difficult to reuse. So therefore, uh, we decided to work on a, on a comparable product um, from a different core material, which is P PET. Well, turned out to be the best is PET. Okay. So, well. thank you, Carol. Jess, yeah. So, why would we use um, a Dasano product instead of um, timber floor? Uh, there's actually no big reason. The, the only reason are the, uh, are the demands of the customer or the consumer. So if the consumer demands a very soft floor, like he's, he's known from LVT, or it's like looking for the properties of LVT, like for example, in the bathroom, um, where you would not use a, par a regular parquet floor. There are some exceptions, but you would not, you normally not use a regular parquet floor. So therefore we designed this PET floor to make uh, a step into the right direction. Uh, and, and our vision basically is to make uh, the PET uh, as, well, to be able to recycle the PET uh, as good as it is. Um, we are now using like 40% a, a part uh, of recycled PET uh, to produce it. Um, it is the overlay as well as the core, um, the rigid core. So therefore um, we are trying to increase that number and also trying to, uh, yeah, what well, to to increase the, the 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 recycling part, and the point is, um, you cannot. Well, in Germany, I don't know exactly how it is in Great Britain, but in in Germany, it's like not possible to recycle P, uh, PVC. Like it goes into a very difficult uh, process to 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 get rid of it, and they they are using a lot of LVT right now. So we don't know how we're going to recycle this in 10, 15, 20 yeah. years, and this is a big big issue. So therefore, we said, okay. Let's use PET yep. and therefore go for uh, uh, easy recycling part. I mean, it is a big challenge still, like with all the uh, um, uh, the packaging and stuff. So you have to recycle that as well. But uh, it is possible to recycle, and you can dispose it on a proper way, just like the uh, PET floor. So when you yeah, Jess, please. So when you, you have um, th th this recycling loop um, and say at the end of its life and you take it, you take it back out, yeah. uh, how easily is it separable from um, whatever is underneath? Um, and then um, what is your maximum um, number of times that you could not downcycle it, but maintain the same quality without virgin um, PET input. That's basically the biggest issue because now we use an overlay with has the printing colors and um, an acrylic based uh, varnish on top. So to, to make it stable and uh, the core, the rigid core is basically 100% PET. So um, there's no real need to totally separate it uh, because it's mostly PET, but uh, you, as you said, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's very difficult to not to downcycle it. Um, we manage it partly, but uh, the problem is also to get it back from the consumer, because that's the, the the main issue. And what happens now with LVT is like people don't know where to to bring it to, and we're trying to get set up an an, an idea. That's where we where, what we're working on now, very much, uh, very uh, yeah enthusiastically actually to make like a um, create a yeah a cycle basically but it's difficult honestly it's like uh okay. you're, you're on the right Thank track <laughs> yeah yeah it's challenging absolutely challenging yeah okay thanks uh, jess i'm gonna ask if carl have you got any burning questions to the for matthias there's a few questions coming through in the chat We'll ask you to um, put your cameras on and ask those questions in a second. So yeah. get ready, Vicky and uh, Stuart. If you, if you had a magic wand, oh, Carl? Sorry, sorry, if you had a magic wand, what would you improve or change about your product at the moment? Actually, um, yeah, it, it's, it's also the point of, of uh, the price because uh, the cost, uh, because uh, obviously PET is uh, a bit more expensive than uh, the, the regular PC, the PVC. 
but not that much. So like we're very close to, to uh, PVC, but that, that gap, if, if we could close that gap, I think it would be more uh, affordable and obviously more, uh, well, sellable, distributable. Okay. Any other questions, Carl? Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you just, you're putting an acrylic varnish on it at the, at the moment on the top. Is there an alternative to that acrylic varnish in, in production? Not really, to be honest, um, because uh, the, the well the the performance of the product has to be quite high. So um, to make it able to to put it in, in different uh, rooms and everything, so we already had the example before from uh, like the school or something uh, that is possible. But it is really uh, for the product, it's it's challenging. Mm -hmm. So at at this moment, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> and and. Where would you see? Okay, yeah, being fair used? enough. I mean, sorry, Carl. And where would you see your product being used most? What would be the most frequent Say use? Say that for again, it? Carl. The, the uh, right. That, yeah. I think that would be private households. Okay. Uh, private households, uh, light uh, commercial use, these kind of things. I, I mean, it's not uh, specifically designed for heavy commercial or industrial use, but that's, uh, that's the main, main part where we're selling it. Like, uh yeah people that uh, are looking for the advantages of lvt but do not want an lvt for health purposes or for the for the health uh, issue or for like um with other uh, mm. positive aspects like the temor uh, thermoplastic problems like that that is expanding in, in um in uh, during uh, well under the effect of heat that is something that lvt has that uh, pet for example doesn't have or uh, yeah, the VOC matter is uh, really good with PT, but yeah, these kind of things are, yeah. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Matthias. I've got a couple of questions in the Q&A from our audience. So one from Stuart Morris-Jones. So Stuart, maybe I can ask you to put your camera on and take yourself off mute if you can. And um, so we can, we can see you and uh, like we might do in an ordinary event in ordinary times. Um, you can so hear Stuart. him, Simon, but you can't see him, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I've taken myself off of a mute, but uh, yeah, I don't think you'll okay, be able to see well, me. Well, we'll put up. Um, uh, Matthias just touched on it slightly there when he mentioned VOC. Okay, Stuart, thank you. Um, I, from what I understand, PET, as you say, is made use uh, used quite commonly in the production of like bottles. So this is what I understand to be food grade plastic. So assumably uh, the VOCs and the risk of contaminants and um, what I would consider harmful ingredients are not present in PETs, whereas they would be in PVC. Absolutely. So That's exactly uh, one of the main or the main uh, aspect is compared uh, in well together with the recycling party. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you, Stuart. And we've got a question in from Vicky Randalls. So Vicky, can I perhaps ask you to put your camera on and, um, and uh, take yourself off mute and ask your question? Yeah, sure, I've, uh, I've taken off mute, but similarly, uh, I, I can't... Uh... <laughs> Put the video on so unfortunately Thanks, you, you don't get yeah, to that's see fine, me that's fine. <laughs> um, so my um question was similar to the conversation we had previously around installation and whether there was any adhesive um involved in the installation and if so how you get on with that in terms of recycling the product um at, at the end of its life uh not um, not necessarily but we're also working with like the um well, the, the, the good uh, um, glue, I don't know the right word, glue companies. Um, so therefore we have some options there. There are some alternatives also, um, but that's mostly their work to improve the, 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 the adhesive part. But what we uh, offer is like a floating installation. So there's no problem to use it for floating installation. So that's what we actually suggest also. Great, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Okay, thank you, everybody. All right, so um, time is against us. So uh, at this stage, uh, it's 
quite tricky, isn't it? But uh, we're, what we're going to do is to ask the audience to uh, think about the three products and to try and choose one. I know it's challenging, um, but we're going to uh, put up a poll and uh, ask you to click on that poll. Um, thank you, Richard, um, to see uh, who's our winner for today. And in the meantime, whilst you do that, I'm going to um, hand back to the judges and ask them to make uh, their decision as to who, which of the three products has taken their attention and to just briefly say why. Um, so um, can I kick off with you, Jess, because I'm looking at you um, as opposed to the other two judges. I know it's unfair, um, but um, I'm just wondering if there's, if you can perhaps let us know who you think um, how three very deserving products should uh, go through. So thanks, Jess. Thank you. Well, yes, it was a fantastic presentation and we completely appreciate that time is very short to get all the details of um, the whole process, packaging, transport, um, and also end of use um, of your various materials. But in the time that we had, I was most impressed with the sol solus organic flooring um, solution. And um, particularly, I think the, um, would like to hear some more about the click um, system. And uh, that would be my recommendation. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much for um, coming to that decision. So perhaps if I can go to you, Carol, and ask you to um, give us your decision. Yeah, well, thank you for everyone presenting about your products. I felt like Carol, I... thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Carol. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. I felt like I learned something today about all your products. And so thanks for, for taking the time to describe them. I guess in the short time we have without, you know, doing a bit more uh, research and actually I... For me, I always like to have samples and look at things to make a final decision. So that the product I feel I can grasp most confidently and feel um, excited and might buy some because I need some right now is the Graffinstone <laughs> paint. And my husband is a small contractor and um, works with paints a lot. And so uh, I think it's also a product that he might be interested in. A split decision so far from the judges. Um, so, Carl, over to you. Can you uh, let us know which one you, you've selected, please? Yeah, I've got a strange noise in my ears at the moment. My apologies, there's an alarm going off somewhere. Um, I, I I thought the oh, presentations were fantastic. Um, I think that's a smoke alarm, actually. Um, uh, all three presentations were fantastic. Um, <laughs> uh, I, um, <laughs> I, I, I was impressed at the alternative use of plastic by Halo. I was very impressed by the click system on the organic flooring uh, from uh, Solus. Uh, and I, I am impressed with the Graffenstone solution. Uh, in terms of giving us a product uh, that uses very traditional materials in a modern way. Uh, I think in terms of the one that I'm going to have further conversations with, uh, I think there's going to be a further conversation with Solus as a result of today, so I should give them the vote, if that's okay. Uh, thank you. And my apologies for the noise in the background. All right, Carl, thank you very much. You yeah, no, absolutely. Perhaps you should put yourself uh, going to attend to that. Um, yeah, great. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so judges have come through. Um, <clears throat> so the judges have made a decision. So solar ceramics, um, and we've got the responses from the polls here. Yeah. Um, and uh, our, our audience, Richard, do you want to read that through? Of course, yeah. So it looks like uh, Graffenstone is the audience winner. So we've got two winners going through to our grand final. Okay, well, congratulations. Thank you everybody for staying with us. It's been a really exciting event. I'm sorry it's all felt slightly rushed, but that's the nature of time. 
Um, and um, we look forward to seeing you at future events. So next week, we've got the ICE database uh, with Craig Jones. And then the following week, we've got our reuse summit. So we've got some really useful uh, and exciting events coming up. Um, and we've got our members meeting on the, the 8th of December. So do please join up as a member of ASBP and join us for that uh, members meeting to feed into our work for the next 10 years. So it's now 12.30. So I'm going to, thanks for staying with us. Thank you very much to John Thorogood, Aaron Smith, Paul Sears, and Matthias Potmeyer for joining us today. And a big thank you to our judges. So, uh, uh, so that's Carl from Accord, Carol Costello from Cullen and Architects and Jess Rivnack. So thank you for all uh, your time. Perhaps I'll ask you just to hang on for a couple of moments and we'll say cheerio to our audience and um,